Well, Mary, hello. Nice hello. to meet you. Um, would you tell us about your name and your roles? My name and my roles. Mary McDade is my name. I have a number of roles, uh, one of them being that I am a member of Fighting Blindness for the simple reason that I have AMD and I find Fighting Blindness is a fantastic organisation. I get great support from them. Uh, I'm a, a homeowner. I have a big garden. I enjoy crafts and artwork and playing the piano and swimming and lots of other things. Um, I have a lot of friends. I go out as much as I can. I enjoy life. I stay active and in contact with people, which I think is very important. Yes, yes. The um, meeting people and staying together is, is probably one of the most important things that often gets omitted in life. Yeah, I agree, you know. I agree. Um, I'm Neil Ward. I'm actually Dr. Neil Ward, but that's I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a sociologist. I'm a communication specialist, uh, particularly in protest, which which is what brought me to fighting blindness. Um, I've, I've spent a lifetime working as a, a trade unionist, really, um, which is advocating on others' behalf, which is what I do at Fighting Blindness. I'm the head of advocacy and communication. So it's my job to advocate for those people living with sight loss and also to communicate with people that live Excellent. with sight loss. Excellent, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your AMD diagnosis? Um, briefly explain what AMD is and also was the doctor kind when you had your diagnosis? Mm. I had no idea what AMD was when I was first diagnosed. I had begun to find difficulty seeing my iPod, for example, seeing small print. And it began to get worse and worse. And I thought... Something going on here. So I went down to my local pol uh, politician, I was going to say <laughs> optician, who did a scan and said, hmm, something there, all right. And he picked up the phone and rang the hospital and said, uh, there's a clinic tomorrow morning, off you go. So I went down there and then started reading the information and thinking, oh dear, this isn't good news. And... At that stage, I had already developed a loss of central vision. And of course, I had the, the wavy lines, which meant everything I could see was distorted. Now, thankfully, this wet form was only in one eye. I have the dry form in the other eye, which is stable. But AMD, the wet form is where the blood vessels, as I understand it, at the back of the eye are leaking. And so you get this buildup of fluid at the back of the eye, which distorts the, the retina and you get this loss of vision. So when I went along to this visit, I was then after the scan introduced to a specialist and she was fantastic. I wanted to see my scan because I'm like that. I like to know what's going on, even if I don't fully understand it. And she showed me the scan and explained exactly what I was seeing. So I had a much better understanding of what was happening. And she then told me that there was a treatment available, but it was delivered by injection into my eye. And I thought, well, if that's the way it is, that's the way it has to be. Went along and had my first injection. And it's, it's not something I'd want to do every day, but it's not that bad when you know what you're facing. It's the aftermath of it is actually sometimes worse. It can be quite sore when the anaesthetic wears off. Sometimes it's fine, but it's still pretty much a loss of a day at the moment every six weeks. And I could do without that. But look, it works. But it's not a cure, is it? It's treatment? not a cure. It's a treatment. But it's a treatment that improves the situation. It reduces and stops the bleeding. So you don't get this distortion. However, at the moment, I'm only getting about six weeks of prevention between injections. And it's been getting shorter. We're down to six weeks now. So I'm hoping to move on to a newer medication, hopefully in October, which I'm praying will give me a longer gap between the injections. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not a cure, as you say. A cure would be wonderful. I suspect for me it's not going to happen, 
But for younger people coming on, this could be life saving. Really could. A lot of our members have expressed to us that one of the things that they really value is stabilization yes. of their vision. It's the fear of deterioration yes. that affects people a lot more. Absolutely. I mean, when I was diagnosed first, I went home thinking, am I going to end up having to use a stick or maybe even a dog? Will I be able to live alone? How will I manage? Thankfully, this hasn't come to pass. Hopefully it won't come to pass. But it does mean that for the rest of my life, presumably, I'm facing more and more injections. And let's face it, every injection carries with it a small risk. So it's it's not the whole answer. It would be wonderful if we had a cure. You're hoping that the next medicine that comes along will extend the period between treatments. Exactly, exactly. That's the best I can hope for at the moment. But that would be a great, a great improvement. And really so would. just to link in there as well, would it be fair to say, because um, what Fighting Blindness does is raise money. The, the Irish public have been very, very generous. It's not government funded, but we raise money to invest in research to find these treatments and cures. What does that mean to you, knowing that research is a happening? In this all is the time? fantastic. I can't tell you how much I find this invigorating and hopeful because if there is no research, there isn't ever going to be a cure, let's face it. The research is absolutely essential. And it's not just the research, but it's the ongoing development of that research and the bringing it forward into an actual product or an actual treatment. It just has to happen. In the last 41 years, we think about 20 million euro has gone into vision impairment research. But unfortunately, the way that governments tend to work, they are, they, they're they on a five-year cycle. So that goes into the healthcare budget. Yeah. It's not the education and social protection budgets that are looked at at the same time. Yeah. So I think a more holistic approach would benefit everyone Absolutely. because sight loss is something that does affect a lot of people. And it doesn't just affect the person affected, it affects their family, it affects their community, it affects the services that they need and the supports that they need. It's a huge encumbrance to have a loss of sight. It's not just somebody not able to read a book. You know, this isn't, that's not what it's about. It's a huge loss of a lot of your abilities and a lot of your freedoms. And you need a lot of supports that you wouldn't if you could see for yourself, even if you could only see a little bit. You know, if you lose your sight, dear heavens, it's not funny. Um, I think also the general public are not really aware that sight loss isn't binary. You're not... Either you don't either have 20 20 perfect vision or no vision at all, like a kind of darkness descends. Most people are somewhere in between. Yes. Um, there are roughly the same number of people in Ireland living with sight loss as live in County Galway. So that's, that's a lot of people. 275,000 people currently live in County Galway. That is roughly the amount of people that live with some form of sight loss. Yeah. Um, and we've actually, what, a campaign we launched a few years ago was to try to educate people that it wasn't binary because we were hearing, this is a really upsetting story in many respects, of people living with sight loss who were maybe carrying a white cane to signal mm -hmm. and to, to assist mm -hmm. um, were being accosted by people if they were caught looking at their phone because the to the person in the yeah. street they felt affronted that they that somehow this was fraudulent that behavior cheating, that yes. they were cheating mm. when in actual fact there are so many accessibility aids in a modern phone yeah. for all sorts of reasons yeah um, absolutely yeah and i mean even in my case with the amd while i can't read my phone screen in daylight because it just looks blank but i can read my phone at other times you know, I can read it in the house and I can I can use my phone for lots of things, which is absolutely brilliant. 
But I can absolutely understand that somebody's going along trying to feel their way with the stick and just because they're they're not 100% sure that they're seeing everything. Why shouldn't they use their phone for goodness sake? You know, our phones are like our the other end of our arm at this stage. And if suppose you have a fall, what are you going to do? You're going to lie there and wait until somebody turns up to rescue you. If you have your phone, you dial 999 or 112 or whatever it is. Yeah. So I, I, I can absolutely understand at the same time that somebody who sees someone with a white stick thinks, oh, they must be blind. They can't see anything. You received treatment very, very quickly. Uh, and what effect did that have on deterioration of your eyesight? Getting the treatment very quickly meant that it didn't get too bad to the point of no return, if you like, before I started treatment. So it did improve very quickly. Now, it's had its ups and downs, but in general, it's been an up cycle. Um, and, you know, I have the experience of watching my mother-in-law who had AMD in her later years at a point when there wasn't a treatment available or if there was, it was one that she couldn't face undertaking because she had one eye that had a very severe cataract and the other eye, maybe both had cataracts, I'm not sure, but certainly she had AMD as well. And she was terrified to have a cataract operation in case she lost the sight in that eye to match the loss of sight in the other eye, right? So she refused all treatment. Not that there was a lot available, but she became practically blind before she died. And she lost all her social life. She used to play bridge. She used to go for long walks with a friend down the pier in Dunleary. And all of this ended. She became housebound, effectively. And it was sad to see. She was a very intelligent woman, an outgoing, friendly woman who loved her company. And it was heartbreaking. It really was. It, it destroyed the end of her life. We often hear we, 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 the, the, the phrase retirement ruiner because it's age related. Yes. It often, because it's often with it being central vision, it does ruin people's enjoyment of things that they can enjoy in retirement, Indeed. such as reading or watching films and all the things you promise yourself you'll have more time to do. Indeed. So Indeed. Things, and this is one of the reasons why everybody says, Get checked out early, especially what, what, as soon as you're 50, start getting regular eye checks yes. because you the, you were diagnosed early. I was. And that allowed treatment to be more effective yeah. and to retain more of your vision. Yes. And to and in, in suppose, I suppose it offers hope. And Absolutely. Absolutely. And I can do so many things now that I wouldn't be able to do if I hadn't had that treatment. It's balancing up fear and hope, isn't it? It it's, is, it's, actually, yes, yes, it is. They're, it they're is. opposites, but uh, it's very important that people aren't too afraid that they don't go and visit the doctor or have treatment. That, that is, a, that is a, a problem because I think, as far as I'm aware, there are quite a few people who have AMD who won't go for treatment because they're afraid of it or because they're... I don't, I don't know why they, they won't, because to my mind, it doesn't make sense. If there's a treatment, you go and you get it and you fight for it if you have to, you know. Mm. Um, but th there is fear. There is fear and there's misunderstanding. And I, I would love to think that more people would get up and go and look for the treatment. Give it a shot at least and see how it goes, you know. Don't, don't just sit back and wait for everything mm. to disappear on you. Um, you live fairly close to Dublin, don't you? Do. Yeah, so uh, the quality of treatment that you get, how can you tell us about that? It's excellent. It's absolutely top hole. I, I can't praise the, the staff in the hospitals enough and the, the doctors enough. I have had a, a very, very good experience in that I'm well looked after. Um the, the nursing staff are superb as well. They're helpful and kind. They'll offer to walk me down to the door. I don't need that, so I don't accept, but they do offer little things like that, which can make such a difference. I mean, one of the things that struck me one day, I was sitting in the waiting room, chatting to the woman beside me, and she 
was older than me, a good deal older than I am, and she had flown from Donegal to Dublin Airport, got a taxi across to the hospital, was going to have to reverse that journey after her injection. And with my experience of how uncomfortable it can be afterwards, the thoughts of having to head off to fly home, she had great courage. She really did. And I am so grateful that I live, you know, in, a, in an area where there are a lot of hospitals, a lot of doctors, a lot of available treatments. I'm just so lucky. There is a big inequality of care yeah. around the country, there isn't is. there? And, that, and I think that's something that definitely we would like to see addressed because Donegal is quite inaccessible for yes. a, a lot of people. Um, I, I heard a story a couple of years ago, a very touching story about a World War II veteran who was having to travel to Sligo in his 90s for his treatment every month. And it was not served. There's no railway. The bus wasn't reliable enough. And so a taxi was costing an awful lot of money yes. in order to avail of that treatment, yeah. which inequality of care. It is inequality. And it's very, very tough on people who are in rural areas where they can't get to the treatment that they need easily. Neil, why is it so important to... That, that vision loss patients should have access to innovative treatments? Well, first of all, um, because they're, they're possible now. Um, first of all, you know, if something is possible and we've got a breakthrough, then we should do it. I think we all have mm -hmm. an ethical duty that if a treatment is available to improve the quality of someone's life, we should make it accessible available to them. them. Yeah, available to them. That's the first thing. Um, for many, in many instances, there is no cure available. Um, it's not a once-off treatment that reverses sight loss completely. But there are things that make that improve the quality of life always coming available. And one of the things I think is when you have say an, in this example, the Irish public have been very, very generous in funding the research that has made these treatments possible. There's, it seems incongruous then that those treatments would not be available to people at Indeed. the other end. Um, I think that the main, there's, it comes down to one word, and it, I keep reiterating this, is it gives hope. Yes. Access to innovative medicines gives hope. Maybe that this particular medicine is not good for your condition, but you think the next one might be. Yes. Um, and there are a lot of young yeah. people living with sight loss that are hoping that at some point in their life, something will become available, either to stabilise their vision or indeed to reverse it. We know that sight loss can be reversed. Yes. Um, we have early treatments that have done that. Um I was in touch with a young man. He was in Newcastle in England. Um, he received one of the early treatments and he saw his facial features in the mirror for the first time. Wow. Which he said was, you know, a, a real breakthrough moment. It was indescribable. Life is all around your sight. You know, everything you do involves your sight. And to, to lose that is, or to never have it in the first place, is horrendous. Yeah, so that, I suppose that's why we believe at Fighting Blindness that it is vital that people have access to medicines yeah. in a timely manner as well. Indeed. It's sort of, um, and, and that is on a pan-European scale. In some instances, I do believe that Ireland still lags behind a lot of other countries when it comes to access to innovative medicines. Um, and I think we just got to wake up to that. Yeah. A lot of the work, I suppose, that goes on has proved fruitful. We have one of our funded researchers did find a gene associated with AMD. Yes. Which is a breakthrough moment, which gives everyone that sort of sense of hope as well. But there are other conditions that are inherited that are macular de degeneration that aren't age-related. Um, and for example, we've Paralympians living with Stargardt disease, Indeed. which is macular degeneration at a young age. At a young age. Yes. So all of our research to look for treatments and cures, I think, is the best support because not only 
will it yield one day will it yield the treatments it's the hope that the search is given as well provides that yeah. and and the raft of other supports in the here and now are we hope temporarily but you know we do anything about improving people's way of life and making it better is something now is that your experience of what you found with fighting blindness absolutely my first visit to a conference was a real eye opener to me when i realized how much support and help was available and the fact that at the conference in breakout groups we were able to have small groups discussing our relevant condition with researchers and with doctors and able to get from, from the horse's mouth so to speak to get information which was very helpful and very hopeful being given information for example about uh, food supplements and the best way to eat you know what what were the best foods and the best the best ways to behave and the best ways to manage your health to keep your sight as good as you possibly could and you know it's all part of the same story and i found that really very very helpful and my friend who came with me who also has amd we were completely blown away by that first conference so we we've keep we keep going to them all and i'm in touch with fighting blindness on a regular basis about various issues and i'm you know the, the, it's the community sense apart from anything else the being in contact with other people who have similar issues is really very important you know i mean if if you were suffering from a loss of a leg you'd at least like to know somebody else who had one leg wouldn't you so it really does help to have that sort of com community sense uh, and the opportunity to to pick up the phone and say i need help it's just fantastic i think that's a, a huge benefit that comes from fighting blindness and their interaction and their involvement and putting people together as you say at a, at a conference where you have this literally the researchers and the doctors mixing with the patients and literally having a cup of coffee together it's absolutely fantastic if you didn't have access to the treatments that you've received and would that how would that have impacted you as a person the kind of things you like to do it would have reduced my choice of activities hugely i well, i'm an artist i like to paint and draw and you actually can't really paint and draw if you can't see what you're doing i also enjoy craft work i enjoy knitting and cro crochet and sewing and i enjoy making christmas cards and all sorts of things like that and i love playing the piano but i don't play terribly well by ear i like to have the music in front of me and i i need my sight for that and you know for any of these needlework crafts you really have to be able to see what you're doing. You can't just make something indiscriminately because <laughs> it could it could turn out to be anything, you know. Okay. Uh, I brought a few examples along if you'd like to have yes, a look. Yes, please. There's, I see, see some I have embroidery here. there. This is what's called cross stitch, which means that you make a, a little cross, the four holes, you make a little cross, and by using different colours, you can produce a picture I mean, we've and got it's a... actually very fine work so you really need to be able to see to do that yes that's very intricate isn't it i'm, I'm looking at i'm seeing a river a bridge over a river the flowers that are on the on the river bank and all flowing yeah. down from the house in the distance yeah. and yeah. it certainly is very tactile as well it's very tactile, yeah, very tactile. absolutely and that's one of the crafts that i do that's just a very simple little one which is Oh, it's, it's kind of, it's raised, isn't it? Is yeah, a... it's done on parchment. So you actually, if you like, damage the parchment to make it produce these lines. There's another little one, a little snowman, a snowman on a with lake. a scarf, done, yeah. skating on ice, thin skating ice. Skating on ice. Now this is another card I made, which is also parchment work, but it's quite intricate. Oh, very much so. So you're punching little holes. So it's got to be, 100% accurate because if it's not it doesn't look right yeah and a snowflake is a very intricate yes. thing isn't it yeah, yeah yeah but it is very 
uh, fine work and you, you have to see what you're doing. You have to be able to manage it. So without the treatment, this wouldn't exist. It wouldn't exist. No, it wouldn't exist. No, it wouldn't. And you're a photographer as well. Well, not really, no, but I, I do take quite, quite a few photographs on my phone because the phone is a really very good camera. And yes. This top one here is a photograph of the garden at a place called Lillishall in the UK, which is the National Sports Centre. And I go there once a year for a training course uh, because I teach exercise. I think there's a photograph there of a painting that I've done of a pink, purpley pink rose. Right, that's a photograph of a painting. And so, yes. so all of those numerous processes would have been denied you had you not received the time. Absolutely. Timely I couldn't even have taken the photograph in the first place. Yes. There's no way I could have done that painting because there was a lot of detail in it. I couldn't have done any of this. I, uh, a whole section of my life would have been gone. The other things, Neil, that would have been affected would have been my social life, for example. I play bridge. Difficult to play bridge when you can't see the cards. I also, I'm involved in a number of committees. In fact, I had a committee meeting this morning and I have commitment to a number of groups that would involve being either on the committee or being involved in some of the background work. I belong to a Toastmasters group, for example, and this year I am going to be organising the speakers for the meetings, making sure that there are enough people at a meeting to do all the roles that are involved. And that's great fun because you can stand up and talk about whatever your interests are and then you'll get feedback on how good you, how well you spoke and how well you presented your words and you, you get feedback on how to perhaps produce a better speech. This is a lot of fun, a lot of social life that I wouldn't be able to get to if my eyes weren't working properly. Yeah, human interaction. Human is... interaction. It's so important. And because I'm busy, my stress levels are low. And I'll tell you what, I really enjoy gardening. I have a big garden and I absolutely love that. I'll go out to pick a tomato for my lunch and I think, oh, that's a weed. Oh, I need to deadhead that. And three hours later, <laughs> I'm still in the garden, yeah. you know. So, you so live, you're living a very active life is very, what I'm hearing. Very. And and a lot of it is actually reliant, still reliant on your... Absolutely. Sight. And it's not the same for everyone. A lot of people live very well with sight loss, but it requires a whole new raft of skills and learning Absolutely. in order to do that. Absolutely, a whole new load of supports and all the, the things that I love doing now, I couldn't do. I would have to find a whole new lifestyle for myself. Yes, and, and, and I've heard it said before that when you lose the things you love, even if they're a hobby or an activity, there is a sense of grief there and is. bereavement for the life that you used to live. I would believe that absolutely, yes. Neil, how important is it that there should be approval of new medicines? Well, the first thing we have to say about with approval is there are regulations. They're there for a good reason, because you don't want a new medicine to do any harm to anyone, it be it in any kind of category of harm. So all medicines have to go through an approval process, and we totally agree with that. But what's happened at the moment is that the regulators have become very fixated on that the medicine should be seen to show tangible improvements to vision loss. And we kind of get that, you know, because a lot of these medicines are going to cost the taxpayers a lot of money. So in which case they've got to be shown to have some benefit. But what a lot of the clinical trials aren't looking at, and a lot of potentially really good treatments are being rejected because what they do is they stabilise vision. And I think to the regulator, if they're saying, well, there's no improvement, it's just keeping it the same, they're not properly taking account of what keeping things the same means to someone who's seeing their sight loss deteriorating. Absolutely. And Absolutely. it's that voice that needs to come through. And I think it is coming through now. And Good. I think that that's the patient voice coming through saying, no, even if you can't restore my vision, if I just knew 
It was be predictable. It's not going to get any worse. It's not going to get any worse. A lot of people would accept that. Mm. And I think that we're starting to see that message coming out on a global scale. Um, we've talked about the, the Congress we recently held in Dublin. Um, and that came through loud and clear that the message now is be keep careful. What we <laughs> have. Keep what we have. Be careful we don't throw away good potential medicines that will stabilize vision because, you know, they are the things that people want. They provide hope, and what they deliver is security. Because if you've got consistency of vision, for a lot of people, that's enough. Well, this is true because if you know what you have, you can work around it. You know, if, if you know how much you can see, you can work with that. The problem is, as you say, if you start to lose even what you've got, you can't plan for the future very well, can you? No, and that's the point. Is it? And, and for a lot of people, that might even be, I wonder what my vision will be like tomorrow. Yes. You know, because it, it is, it's, it's affected by dramatic, so many yes. factors. It is that dramatic. Neil, if you had a message to give to policymakers, what would it be? I think it would be about equality, equality of care for all citizens based on whether their geographic location or their economic situation. There are many people uh, in this country, in Ireland especially, who are not able to afford private health care. And so they should be afforded the same access as the more wealthy citizen. But also in terms of the geographic geography of the country. There are some parts of the country that are very inaccessible to hospitals. There's a potential to have treatment centres on a monthly basis, you know, in, in the regions. And I think that that's yes. got to be looked at as soon yeah. as possible because not everyone has the fortitude to live in the capital city where everything is more available. Indeed. I think Ireland, as I've said, is is leading the way in many respects. It's been a real centre of excellence. And we've through the generosity of the Irish public, we've made a lot of scientific breakthroughs and also through the sort of the economic policies of the Irish government since the sort of the second half of the 20th century, we've been able to see a lot more manufacturing of pharmaceutical products in Ireland. We've got a very educated workforce and a stable workforce. And, and and a very stable political country as well. So it's it's a centre of innovation. We're making new medicines, but one thing we don't want to be is the Irish citizen doesn't want to be the last citizen in Europe to access to have the medicines benefit. that are, are really created and made here. And that is the important message that we're sending to our own government all yeah, the time. Very important, very yes. Very important. Thanks for listening to the Innovate for Life podcast. If you found this episode interesting, please share and look out for other episodes in our Life Because of New Medicine series. Thank you.